You're listening to a podcast of Spurious Morality. And welcome to a podcast of Spurious Morality. I'm Johnston, and joining me this week, I have Greg. Hello. And we've got Jimmy too. Hey. Uh, and it's it's a season by season, uh, and we're up to season 12, which, when we started doing this, getting to Tom Baker seemed absolutely light years off, and we've arrived. We've got to Tom Baker. We are, we're in the mid-70s, and... Uh, we're going to be with Tom Baker for quite a while because obviously he did seven seasons. Um, season 12, I think, is an interesting one. I'm glad we've got to it. It's a good season. I think it's probably not too controversial a thing to say that season 12 is perhaps the the best known season of classic Doctor Who. I think that sort of when people think of think of classic Who, season 12 is perhaps the one that they go to. You know, it's got some immensely popular stories arc in space genesis of the daleks it's got three stories with sort of returning well-known monsters cybermen daleks and Santarans are all in there um it's the classic lineup of the doctor sarah and harry uh, there's a unit story in robots so there's there's quite a lot in this one that's sort of in some ways it's kind of archetypal classic doctor who um and it also seems to be you know, the first one to, uh, well, it got a Blu-ray release. I think it's the only classic series to have a script book released. I could be wrong there, but as far as I'm aware, they did season 12 and then stopped. So we've got we've got quite a well-known season, and there are some very good, very well-known stories in there. Um, oh, and of course, even the first VHS, Revenge of the Cybermen, came from this season. Um so before we get cracking on each story, I am going to ask you, gents, what your favourite from this run is. So you go first, Greg. Well, it's Genesis of the Daleks, and I honestly, we'll see what you guys say, but I honestly have a hard time knowing how you could pick any of the others as the best of the season. I mean, Genesis is arguably the best Dalek story of the classic series. It's we'll talk about it in a little bit, but it's it's just incredibly tense and and grim and and and, and has so much lore and and has fantastic acting and it's it's a it's a ten out of ten Doctor Who story. Uh, it's it's a very difficult opinion to disagree with that is Genesis is kind of an example of I think everything just coming together really, really well. I think it is kind of classic Doctor Who achieving something bigger than it should be able to and doing a damn good job of it. Uh, I can understand why it's it's a go-to. What about you, Jimmy? Much as I love Genesis of the Daleks, I think it's... Um... It's great and it's very popular, but I think it's slightly overrated, I'm going to be controversial and say. And while I do enjoy it a lot, I have to say, give a special mention to Robot. As it's just so much fun and it makes such a perfect bridge between the end of Pertwee's era and the start of Tom's. I mean, probably Genesis is objectively the best of the season, but my favourite would be Robot. Genesis is still a very close second, though. Uh, I'm with you, you see. I, Yeah, you can look at Genesis objectively, and it is an exceptionally good Doctor Who story. It is, as I said before, doing everything above and beyond. But I'm with you. I'm kind of voting with the fun factor. Um, 
I'm going with Revenge of the Cybermen, though, because it's definitely flawed. It's not the perfect Doctor Who story by any means, but it was one of the first stories that I ever saw. I think it was probably the first story that I saw that wasn't a multi-Doctor story, actually. Um, and it, it, it it's fun. I, it, maybe it's the nostalgia, maybe it's... I don't know, but Revenge of the Cybermen is always kind of my go-to from this season. I enjoy it a hell of a lot. Well, I've been proven definitively wrong, then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, I can totally see where you're coming from, though. I can, you know, I, it, Genesis, like I say, it's just a fantastic production. It, it's it's brilliantly done. It is a great story. The writing, acting, everything is perfect. But I guess I'm voting with my heart and not my head, really. Um, but we will get to all of these stories in the next, uh, well, 45 minutes or so. Uh, the first one we're going to go to is Robot. Um, it picks up pretty much immediately from where, in fact, it doesn't even pick up from where Planet of the Spiders left off. There is a reprise. You actually see the regeneration again. Um, it's it, It's an excellent story. It does a great job of introducing the new Doctor. It doesn't mess about with are we sure he's the Doctor, any of that? You know, Sarah and the Brig both actually saw the regeneration, so there's no kind of two episodes of trying to work out who who the Doctor is. Is he the Doctor or not that we had in uh, that we had in Spearhead from Space? And to an extent, we had in uh, Power of the Daleks as well. Um, and it kind of lets the story just get going. We have a little bit of the Doctor settling into his new body and some brilliant moments of just Tom Baker being Tom Baker. We get Harry introduced sort of very quickly and efficiently. Uh, and all of a sudden we've got this kind of new normal. And I think it, it just, it happens so smoothly in that first episode. It's perfectly done. Uh, so Jimmy, you said it was your favorite. So you talk to us about Robot first. Yeah, well, as I said, I think the thing that makes it so special for me is the way it's a sort of bridge between the end of Pertwee and the start of Tom's era. It feels like a traditional unit story that you've got the Doctor being totally different and, you know, compared to Pertwee being more, you know, traditional and old-fashioned sort of and having the sort of um, Venusian Aikido and that, you've got Tom just being... Tom and being nuts, especially when he's just regenerated and he's trying on the costumes and they say he's changed and he thinks, oh, he thinks he's regenerated again before he realises they're talking about his clothes. And, yeah, it's just, it, it's the perch when you're a bit given a sort of a kick and a change and it really works well for me. And um, I love that for just, you know, if you'd seen way back in Power of the Daleks and you think, oh, yeah, the second Doctor was a bit nuts at first, but he calmed down. Like, Tom doesn't calm down. Tom's just, this is who his Doctor is and he establishes it straight away and, the dynamic with the regulars is great. They're all sort of trying to get used to him and Sarah's heartbreak when the Doctor looks like he's going to go off in the TARDIS without them all and he sort of comes back and listens to them and mistakes the Brigadier for Alexander the Great and such. It's it's just so good. And I loved the little throwback in terms of the regeneration to when he tries to get into the TARDIS, he finds his key in his boot just like Pert where he had the key in his boot way back in Spearhead and it, whether it's intentional and that was a purposeful throwback or whether it's a coincidence, it just, it really ties things together. And, um, yeah, I think that it's one of the more downside things is I think Sarah, she, as a character, worked better in the third Doctor era. Like, here she starts to become a bit more, she's got a great dynamic with Tom. Like, actor chemistry-wise, obviously, her dynamic with Tom's probably better, but... Things like when she mistakes the guy, the director of the um, Institute of Scientific Research or whatever, and she instantly assumes it's the guy. Like, I mean, it's a silly gag making fun of her feminism and that, but, like, I mean, surely in character terms she would have had to have researched the place and she would have had to have known the director's name was Hilda. Like, she's, it's not believable for Sarah Jane to make a mistake like that, but, you know, little faults like that are, are quibbles you can find with any story, no matter how great, and... I think um, overall she works well in this story, but it, it is sort of the start of things going downhill a bit for her. But, yeah, I love her dynamic investigating the SRS and giving the jab to them about, oh, yeah, I'll put you in the um, newspaper between the flying saucer nutters and the flat earthers. <laughs> and 
yeah, it's it's just such a good story. But um, then you've also got um, the other thing that's a bit silly is the whole, oh, America, Russia and China all gave control of all of their nukes to the UK. And it was like, it's obviously a bit ridiculous, but it's almost worth it for the doctor's whole jab about, oh, yes, only Britain could trust trusted. The rest are all foreigners. <laughs> and, of course, you've got the silly toy tank as well. But um, overall, it's... It's a really great story and it really develops the characters well. Like Harry gets a pretty good introduction and he's clearly going to be the sort of straight man to the Doctor's new nutcase sort of persona. But um, Sarah as well, like the dynamic with her adapting to this new Doctor and at the end of the story when she's sort of not sure whether to go with him or not and her being the first one that he offers a jelly baby to and him making the comment about the robot being almost human and the whole... You know, it can't be no point being grown up if you can't be childish sometimes. It's like the whole team's got their development and it's like in just a single story, like things have already been established. It's like it's already completely moved on from the Perch We Era, even though a large part of the story is a throwback to it. And I just think it works really spectacularly well for me. And yeah, I love it and I love all the regulars and I love this new dynamic that gets set up. I think the fact that this story was like made by the outgoing production team really works in its favor i actually think there's a really really good crossover of eras here it's very much a pertwee story it's a pertwee unit story it could drop into seasons eight nine ten or eleven quite comfortably uh but it, it's as you say it's shifting things forward it's introducing new characters changing dynamics and Sort of, it's almost throwing Tom Baker's Doctor into a John Pertwee's Doctor situation, just kind of seeing how he deals with it differently. Um, yeah, it, it's great. I think it works incredibly well, um, and it's it is more of an epilogue to the Pertwee era than the beginning of the Tom Baker era. In some ways, we don't really get to see Tom's Doctor properly in the way that he's going to be until the next few stories. I think it's fair to say the arc in space is the first story where we really sort of get to, uh, well, where, where Tom uh, kind of starts to really establish what he's going to do in the role. And we've got the whole world of regeneration settling down a little bit thing, which we kind of get across a lot of doctors. Uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on it? I enjoy robot quite a bit. And, you know, and you both talked about this, but I think the most interesting part of it is the changeover in the production team. I mean, I know this wasn't uncommon in the early days of, of Doctor Who, but when you think about it, you've got the uh, Barry Letts, Terrence Dix team on the way out the door. Um, you're bringing in, you know, Hinchcliffe and Holmes, and yet the outgoing production team gets to cast the new Doctor and gets to write and produce the new Doctor's first story. And so you end up with this kind of odd situation where, as you've said, the new doctor is now firmly like placed in a story of the previous era. Now, I, I you know, in, in, a, in a modern production, I just can't imagine that would ever happen. Like, I can't imagine anyone wanting to, you know, become the new producer of Doctor Who and be told, yeah, but the, you know, but the last thing the previous producer is going to do is pick the new doctor for you. Like that wouldn't fly, but I mean, obviously it worked because they cast the, you know, the, the greatest and most iconic, you know, actor to play the part and, you know, became a, a an absolute legend. And I think Robot is, is fascinating as that Pertwee story with a new doctor in it, because, Apart from just his, you know, his personality and, and his innate alienness and his weirdness, like what makes Tom Baker so great in this is like this doctor has an almost almost has like a disdain for what he's been asked to do here. Like he's visibly bored. Like he knows what he basically knows what's going on the entire time. Like when he's the scene when he's like confronted with the robot, like he's, he's almost like gleeful and how much, and how he's running around the room, like, you know, staying away from it. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, 
this that you can tell this is a character that needs like a larger canvas to paint on like he needs a bigger problem to solve and and that's not what the Pertwee era was about. I mean, the Pertwee era was so much about, you know, random threats coming to or arising from Earth, whereas Tom Baker's going to be off in space facing, you know, universe-ending threats week in and week out. So, yeah, it's a little bit different in that respect. And what I also like about it is, you know, it has one more example of the ambition of the the Let's and Dicks era just far exceeding its capability when they decide we're going to do King Kong and then they take you know they they blow up the the robot to giant size and it, it it honestly works better I think than it has any right to but it's still just like when the robot's growing you're just sitting there like oh come on you don't really think you can do this do you and but they 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 give it the best try they can which is what characterized the era. Um, no, I like Robot. I mean, yeah, it's it's a great introduction for the Doctor. Um, it's Harry's fun, although as we know, like production wise, he's kind of an extraneous character based on who they ended up casting in the role. Um, you know, it's interesting to see this Doctor's relationship with the Brigadier, like to starting to define his relationship with Sarah. Like, yeah, it, it's 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 so much fun to watch. It's just by the end of it, you're realizing like, okay, now we can now we're going to leave earth and now we're going to see where this is actually going like you say it, it's it, it is a very very uh dicks let's era story um and it, it's it, like i said before it's kind of like one last hurrah for that production team and i think they just they absolutely nail it and you know they did nail casting the dot to tom baker was perfect absolutely perfect for the role and it just gets so much right and it kind of it serves as a nice love letter to what's come before, what's come previously, and still manages to look forward. It does have its faults. We've talked about the tank. We've talked about the um, interesting effect of uh, the robot growing, uh, and it, it it works. Yeah, it, it's it, it's fun to watch. It's believable, and it's yeah, it's a decent story. It's a strong start for Tom, and it it, it does everything that it needs to do. Uh, also, obviously, has the sort of quite nice, I think, uh, point of giving Benton a promotion. Um, he's been a corporal, he's been a sergeant for the entirety of the Pertwee era, so now he gets bumped up a bit, and it kind of acknowledges that they never really replaced uh, Mike Yates either after the invasion of the dinosaurs. So, yeah, it's a nice little touch, I think. Um, it's a shame that we don't really get to see much more Benton after this. He's only in two other stories moving forward, but it's um, it, it is a nice little touch. We'll move on, and we'll move on to the second story. Then the Ark in space. Um, so we've we've left Earth behind, we've left Unit behind, and we are into uh, into space, as the title would imply. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that a few years later uh Ark in Space was remade and called Alien. Um, it seems to be virtually identical plot wise. Uh I think it's a decent story. It's perhaps one that does get a little overrated. It's considered by many to be a sort of a classic, one of the best examples of classic Doctor Who ever. I'm not entirely convinced it is. I think it can be a bit slow in places. I think having emotionless, almost guest cast kind of perhaps doesn't help. It's a solid enough story, but it's uh, it, it's not my favourite, but it's, it's nowhere near my least favourite either. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, so Ark in Space, Greg, do you want to go first? I agree with you. It is a little bit overrated. It's, it is defining in many ways, like, unlike what I was just saying about Robot, I mean, this is putting the Tom Baker doctor into, you know, more of the sort of situation that he'll be confronted with as his era continues. But I just, it's hard to like really connect with this story. I mean, like you say, the, the guest performances are intentionally like subdued and, and robotic, and it makes it really hard to sympathize with any of the guest cast, even though you're supposed to, because they're the last survivors of humanity. Um, I don't like that the story really 
doesn't know what to do with Sarah, and she spends a lot of it just kind of standing around looking helpless. And I think I think some of the stories in season 12 are a bit of a step back for her character, which is unfortunate. Um, it, a lot of this is really just left to Tom Baker to like, you know, keep things moving forward, like with his energy and, and he gives it a, a great try. And of course there's that legendary, you know, homo sapiens speech and, and that's fantastic, but yeah, it's, it's, it's trying to be frightening. And, you know, I understand that, evidently like the bubble wrap thing was wasn't as you know obviously a packing material in 1975 as it is now but like it they they, they really you know put everything into it but you know but, but wrestling with the with the possessed arm just kind of looks silly and it's it, it doesn't it doesn't quite pull off what it's going for it, it's trying to go for this like oppressive like horrific tone and it's it's trying to get to the point that we really see start to pick up in you know seasons thirteen and fourteen with the you know the the gothic horror you know sort of thing, and it just it doesn't quite get there. I will say though, like everyone talks about Alien, and you know I don't think anything's ever been officially confirmed, but man, I was really like surprised this time when I watched it just how similar it is in so many ways to Alien. I mean, you know the the crew having slept for a long time, the alien organism like laying its offspring inside the, you know, living bodies, the, just some of the set design, the, the white, you know, jumpsuits that everyone's wearing. Like it's very, if it's not a visual influence, it's a huge coincidence. We'll put it that way. Um, so that was fascinating to see. Um, and yeah, I mean, like Pretty much every Tom Baker story for seven years, you can always say like, yeah, but Tom is awesome in this. And that is certainly true here. And, and that one of the best things about his era is that he is so good in the part that like, even if something's a little, you know, tedious, like he's always going to be doing something different and something interesting. He's always going to throw some ridiculous grin on his face when it's completely inappropriate to do so. And, you know, that, that sort of thing I, I do like, I just this story just it it's it's held up as this like absolute titanic classic of doctor who and i've seen it countless times and no matter how many times i've watched it i've just i've never quite understood that reputation i'm glad it's not just me i've always thought that me going yeah it's not my favorite is a bit of a controversial statement um it's decent enough. It, you know, it, it's not doing any harm. It's not an actively bad story. And like you say, it's completely saved by Tom Baker, but so is the entirety of the Tom Baker era. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it, I don't know, it feels like there's something missing. It feels like the, the, there's a, a bit of action or a set piece or just, just something that's not quite there that just doesn't, it just leaves me feeling like there could have been more, but it, it did go through a bit of a funny production process. It did have, um, there was a complete rewrite, wasn't it? It was written uh, originally by, I think it was John Lucarotti, and then Robert Holmes basically started again from scratch. And now that we've got the original version from Big Finish, we can see actually just how much did change. Um, Jimmy, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, for me, I'd definitely say, yes, it's a great story, but yes, it's also a very overrated story. Um, lots of positives about it, lots of negatives too. So I'll try to start with, I'll try to mix between the two. So one of the things I loved most is the whole line when they revive Noah about Noah being a name from mythology. Like most stories wouldn't have the courage to sort of call Christianity mythology. They'd be like a name from religion or a name for history, but Doctor Who doesn't hold its punch and just calls it mythology quite happily, and I love I love that sort of attitude in the show. Um, things I also love is the Doctor's characterization in this. Like, yeah, there's the Homo sapiens speech, and then there's also stuff like the way he goads Sarah to get out of the tunnel, and he's very, oh, you suck, you can't do this, blah blah blah. And as soon as she comes out, he's like, yes, you do, Nini, it's okay, and just the way he's like the manipulative sort of thing is usually a sort of seventh doctor thing, but he's very manipulative there, but he's also nice and good at the end of it. And so, yeah, that was interesting. And 
uh, other things with Tom that I like is it's a bit harsh, but his line about Harry's mind only working because of his own influence is <laughs> very, very Tom. It's just such a good thing. But, yeah, in terms of the more negative side of things, Sarah Jane is at her absolute worst here. Like between the lack of air at the start and she overplays that a bit and then getting drugged and then having to recover from the drugging, like the whole story, she's just very off and nowhere near at her best. And it's a real shame because I think the Doctor and Harry kind of shine in this story that Sarah really gets the dud end of the stick and kind of fails throughout it. And the one good thing I'd say for Sarah in this story is I love her line about the doctor only talking to himself because no one else understands. That's that's a great piece of character stuff for both of them. But, um, yeah, it's a good, fun story. And I think, you know, there's some bits might not have been realised as well as they could be. Like, um, that's one of the faults with it. Like, in the background, you've got all the suspended animation um, survivors of Earth, and the, most of them it looks fine. But there's a couple. There's one who I forget which what dialogue it was, what exact scene. But there's one scene where the Doctor's talking to Harry, and the suspended animation person behind them blinks about four times in the conversation. <laughs> and then there's another one where the um, the cells for them all are uniform sized, but they've obviously got a young kid or a really short person and this one of the guys is like their head is only at the shoulders height and it looks like well you'd think they would have molded these things individually it's a bit silly to have a uniform size pot and then you know do that but yeah as I say that's the faults with the story rule in the realization of it it's the actual writing is pretty great and I think it yeah it works quite well overall but yeah as I say there's um Lots of negatives as well as the positives in this. It's pretty balanced. Oh, I nearly forgot. My other favourite thing about the story that I really like is Harry's line at the start about the police should just use the TARDIS as an actual police box because it's a nice throwback. Again, I don't know whether intentional or not, but Dodo basically said the same thing in the war machines and I always love when those little things like that pop up. It's. Um, I'm glad that we all agree on it being a bit overrated, actually. that's That surprised me a tad. Um I, I I do feel like I've sort of done it down a little bit. Um, and as Jimmy pointed out, the writing is excellent. Like this is a very, very good Robert Holmes script. This is there's some absolutely fantastic dialogue, some fantastic interactions. Like I say, for my money, there's just, there's something missing from this story. There's some kind of action or some kind of, it just feels like not much happens really over the course of the 90 or so minutes. Um, but yeah, everything that's in there is great. You know, all of the, all of this dialogue and that kind of thing. I um, did actually nearly forget to mention one other thing that I thought that was um, both a positive and a negative on the positive side. It showed a good idea of their sort of concept of the future. But again, the execution failed is they have the doctor's mind about, oh, it's all of humanity, all colours, all creeds, and then, of course, every single person in the cast is white and all bar one of them are men. It's, yeah, it's just lovely that they thought, oh, let's be optimistic and let's say everyone's welcome in the future, and then they executed it like that. <laughs> I mean, it, I suppose, at the very least, implies that there's some kind of command structure that results in all of the the commanding officers being white. Yes, I guess that is a bit of a um a not great part of the story. Um but yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Um and you know I'm I'm glad it's there. I'm glad it's part of Doctor Who. I think Doctor Who's better off for it. The women are really a fantastic villain. You know, it's we've taught we've compared it to Alien. Um and like the concept of the alien in Alien is is absolutely brilliant, and the uh, women are basically the same concept. Uh, they've been used pretty effectively by Big Finish as well on a couple of occasions. Um, it, it's the yeah, they're a decent villain. Um, we'll move on, and we'll move on to um, a, a rare two parter. It's a short story, uh, the Sontaran Experiment. So we've got a returning villain, um, and it's. Obviously, at this point, just a villain from the previous series. It's not like Daleks and Cybermen, who've popped up quite a lot. Uh, this is 
this is a, a relatively rare event at this stage in Doctor Who, um, a returning monster uh, that's not Dalek Cyberman. Um, I think this is quite a good little story, actually. It's it's nice and fast-paced. I really like the fact that it's all um, all done on film, all done on location. It's not done on film, that's a lie. But it's all done on location. I think that's really effective. Um, and it, it actually gives every single one of the regulars something decent to do so harry gets his own little uh, extra piece sarah gets tortured and the doctor gets to be sort of the big big brave action man which is a role that he's we've certainly not seen him really play before you know we've had sword fights with the master in the sea devils and it was all a bit whimsy and stopping to eat sandwiches halfway through this is just the Doctor having a bloody nasty scrap with the Sontaran. Um, and I, it's a side of the Doctor we don't often get to see, but I think it works. I quite like it. Um, so, Greg, you go first. Sontaran experiment. Yeah, I like it too. I mean, there, there's really not much to it because it's it's so short. Um, it, it's it's a disposable sort of story. I mean, when you really boil it down, it's it's just 40 minutes of people just kind of running around from place to place on location. But um, yeah, you know, to your point, like the fact that it gives all the characters something to do is, you know, after Ark in Space is refreshing. Um, and, it, and it's really simple, just like split the characters up and let them meet different people and it, and it works. I mean, you know, having Harry fall down the pit, and, you know, and seeing him lying motionless at the bottom, like it's, there's a, there's a sort of, like you were just talking about the fight scenes being different. I mean, I think just in general, like as we get into the the Hinchcliffe era, there was a comfort to the Pertwee era that kind of starts to go away here a little bit. Like, obviously they're not going to kill Harry off, but like, you know, seeing him like in that, you know, helpless and, 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 you know, possibly broken position is it's, it's a little stunning. Like it's, it's surprising to see that they're, they're going there. I mean, having you know, Sarah being tied up and, and put through some horrific torture. I mean, that's, that's very dark. I mean, that is not the kind of thing that we saw, you know, even a year ago. And yeah, like the fight with, with Steyer is just violent. And, and, <laughs> and of course it led to, you know, Tom getting injured and then not being able to do most of the action scenes himself. And I mean, that's, fairly well-known lore so I, I don't know how obvious it is if you have no idea but to me like watching the story it's really obvious that they're having to shoot around the fact that Tom Baker can't move very well there's a lot of like you know over the shoulder perspective shots there's a lot of you know shots where you can't even see like his lower body moving around like it, it there's a lot of you know quick cuts to where they can put a stunt double in um, but I mean putting obvious stunt doubles into fight scenes is, a, you know, something we got quite used to in the Pertwee era as well. So it's not out of place here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a, it's a surprisingly nasty little story in many ways. Like what I, you know, we were, we're used to with the new series, you know, the Suntarans being dangerous. Yeah. But also being, you know, the figures of, of, you know, having a little bit of humor and a little bit of, you know, fun. They're so self-obsessed that it's funny. But I mean, here, Steyer is just a, a vicious character. I mean, like literally the plot of the story is an alien has come to Earth and is subjecting the humans he finds there to increasingly brutal tortures to understand how easy Earth will be to invade. Like that is dark and and that's like the sort of thing that the show is going to go into more and more and so even though it is kind of a disposable little runaround it's it's another indication of like where doctor who is headed and uh yeah and you know selfishly uh steyer is also one of the you know greatest guest characters in the history of television uh, i can't think why you might think that at all <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it's. I think it it works quite well, and I think obviously they had to be quite innovative with it. They're completely on location, so it's already unlike any other Doctor Who story there has been before at all, with the exception of Spearhead, which again was sort of the result of them having to be pretty creative. 
with this, obviously, they had to be creative with Tom. You know, the way it is shot, like you say, is influenced by what happened. Um, I I do think that perhaps um, they uh, they went into this thinking we can do something visually different here. We can do something striking. And there are some very, very pretty gruesome, actually, great visual moments sort of you know sarah being tortured and sort of seeing things that aren't really there and harry at the ditch as you mentioned and um like when steyer is killed it's it's brilliant his head basically deflates like a balloon it's just so well it's so well executed it looks good it looks gruesome um this is this is definitely an indication that doctor who is growing up a bit and uh you know there were people that argued it grew up a little bit too much over sort of this season and the the two that follow it anyway jimmy your go uh santone experiment yeah there's not really much you can say about this one it's over pretty quick i mean the, the first two part has since you know back in hartnell's time um and yeah it goes really quick uh, i do like that it's, um follows up quite well on the time worry with Sarah being scared because she sort of recognises this Sontaran and she thinks it's Lynx because they're all clones. And um, it, it shows her fear of the Sontaran and it shows how she's developed. Um, uh, one thing I would have to say, a bit of a negative one in terms of development, is the costuming development. I think the Sontaran here is much less well-realised visually than it was in the previous season. I seem to remember reading somewhere they had to change the costume because it was really hard to breathe in for the actor. But, um, yeah, obviously, of course, change it in that case, but it's a shame they couldn't make it look as good as it used to. And it's really weird seeing us on Tyron with five fingers. <laughs> I mean, they hadn't really explicitly said anything about the three fingers in dialogue, but, you know, they had three fingers in their previous appearance and suddenly they've got five, but also they're a clone race. <laughs> um yeah, but um, the actual story is really good, really atmospheric, some great material for the Doctor and Sarah and Harry. And I also love the um, the little throwaway line. The Doctor remembers having notes about the Sontarans in his 500-year diary, which, um, of course, in, in the Pertwee story in the previous season, he said he'd met the Sontarans before. And, of course, the 500-year diary is a Troughton thing. And so it almost accidentally foreshadows the two Doctors. And I love little tie-ins like that, whether they're intentional or unintentional or retroactive or, you know, um, it's always quite good to see things like that. I think the only real major fault with the story is the ending with the Doctor talking to the other Sontaran on the scanner and basically getting rid of the invasion fleet in like two seconds flat comes a bit easy like i think it would have been a lot better if they just cut the other on and just had it be Steyer by himself or if you're going to do the invasion thing you know give an extra episode and actually deal with it properly but you know as i say that's a small quibble and apart from that sort of thing the story is yeah pretty great so yeah that's that's about all i can say about it really it if nothing else it fills two episodes of of the season in a interesting different and inventive way and it, it does let the new production team kind of just start to establish some of their their tropes their their motif as it were um i yeah i think it's fun i think it does its job it doesn't set out to be big and epic and the greatest doctor who story ever it just it, it's kind of a humble 50 minutes of pretty decent entertainment actually um as i said it's a good story for all the regulars and yeah i think there's plenty to enjoy in some term and experiment um we'll move on to a story that did set out to be big and epic and potentially the best doctor who story ever though genesis of the daleks um it, it it's massive it, it it's actually difficult to believe that it was produced so well that it was done so well it's it's ambitious it's ridiculous and you know i think there'll always be some level of debate about how much of it was terry nation and how much of it was robert holmes and uh it, it's like i say it's just bonkers that it's so good um it, it's impossible to watch it and not go yeah this is exceptional this is it's almost raising the bar i think it probably is the best looking 
um, story there has been uh, up until this point, and it's it's not going to be surpassed particularly often moving forward. Uh, it's your favorite, Greg. So you go first. Yeah, I mean this is a classic, and it's a classic for a reason because it's really good. Um, you know, I will just start getting this out of the way. It's a six-parter, and there is some padding in here, unfortunately. I mean, the, the whole bit with the, the mutant clan is just kind of ridiculous. And, you know, honestly, the, the mutos, like, I understand that they exist, like, as a concept to show how both of these societies are willing to just cast out the unlike, especially when you find out that these, you know, apparently horrifically, you know, mutated, awful monsters are in fact just like normal people that just look a bit different so i understand the point of that but at the same time they really add nothing to the story and you could remove them and not lose anything um so those points aside like this could probably you know this could probably have been five parts honestly those points aside there's really nothing to complain about here at all like it's 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 so well made, first of all, like it's, it's so convincingly done like these, you know, the, the, the trench warfare, you know, the, the corpses propped up, like it's a, it's a genuinely grim and, and terrifying environment that they're thrown into, you know, right from the beginning. Um, just the, you know, the, just the concept right at the start of like the time Lord sending the doctor on a mission, like, well, we saw that before in the Pertwee era, but it was always, you know, like, here's a box and go figure out who to give it to. Whereas in this story, it's no, go avert the creation of the Daleks. Like this is a level above anything that's been done before. And I understand why, like later on, we've retconned this into a, you know, an aggressive action in the time war. Um, it's, it's such a cool concept. And then just the, the tone of it is just so grim and, and downbeat and, and it's so different than almost anything we've seen. I mean, some Taran experiment had some nastiness to it, but this, this, this entire story is just dark and the, the characters are, are so good. I mean, like, I mean, it, Niter is one of the great villains in Doctor Who and that's when he's got Davros standing next to him like just this brilliant portrayal of the absolutely obsessed and committed you know Nazi officer effectively and then I mean what can you say about Davros like one of the one of the great characters in Doctor Who history I mean one that will come back for increasingly ludicrous reasons going forward but is clearly intended here as just a standalone character. I mean, he is very obviously killed at the end. It's it's a wonderful story of like of his of his absolute single minded dedication towards you know purifying the Khalid and then the Dalek race and then you know his hubris getting the best of him at the end when he realizes that he himself is not up to the standards that he has set for his creations and then he ends up suffering the same fate as everyone else. And, you know, there's, I mean, there's, this is, this is not a, a subtle, you know, commentary on Nazism and World War II and Hitler and so forth. Like it, it's, it's very clear what, you know, what Terry Nation is going for here, even more clear than when he went for it in the first Dalek story back in 1963. Um, but you know, there's the other thing too is it it's it's hard to tell you know exactly how much of this is Terry Nation and how much is Robert Holmes, but to produce this story, you know, a year after Death to the Daleks and two years after Planet of the Daleks is is stunning to me. Like this is this is better in almost every way. And and while there are you know some little you know Terry Nation. Um, moments in here like Sarah gets a lot to do in this story she's a really like compelling character but it, it like the, the the conflict between the two styles I think is summed up in the scene where they're trying to escape by climbing up the scaffold through the roof like on the one hand Sarah's the one who decides that it's time to escape plans the escape inspires everyone else to escape leads them up the scaffold and then like halfway up just becomes like really scared and can't move and then has to be talked into, you know, progressing by some other character. And it's just like, what, who is this? Like, 
this isn't like a, a moment of characterization where you realize, oh, you know, this is a multifaceted character. It's just like, oh, we've, we've all of a sudden we're going back to helpless, you know, early 1960s female companion archetypes. And it's, it's a little bit eye rolling, but it, it shows like the two different, you know, styles on, on display here. And I think that's interesting. I mean, Tom Baker is utterly fantastic in this. Like, I mean, as good as he was in Ark in Space, like this is really the story where he just grabs the role. And, you know, this is, you can really see why so many hold him up as the greatest of all the doctors. Like his, his confrontations with Michael Wisher are, are just, just fantastic. Like the writing and some of Davros' speeches is so good. I, I can, I can rant about how brilliant this is for four hours but we don't have hours so i'll cut myself off but but man like this is this is something truly special and we can really see like this is a hint of the golden age that we're we're heading into i think that one day an episode of this podcast will just be an hour of you talking about how brilliant genesis is um you're absolutely right it, it, it's a marvelous story everything just seems to work everything falls into place and produces something you know really really special it it, it is absolutely great to watch it's like you say, it's a six-parter we've had a lot of really overly padded six-parters and there are little bits in this there's no escaping that but it's it's still gripping like the whole thing is just really gripping even the clam i mean the clam's literally gripping it's gripping harry's ankle but uh, like there's tension to this like there's yeah, like exactly. there's moments where you're watching and it's like oh man like what's going to happen next and i even as much as i love doctor who like you don't get a ton of that in the classic series also, the final episode, and I love the final episode of Genesis of the Daleks. I think it's one of the best individual episodes of Doctor Who ever produced. And it's just a lot of people stood around talking until the Daleks get a bit shooty right at the end. But it, it, it's it's gripping. It's fantastic. It's really tense. And you are following this. You know, people are stabbing each other in the back, left, right and centre. There are moral debates going on. The Doctor, Sarah and Harry just want to get the hell out of there. They're just, at this point, they are just trying to escape. Like, get the time ring and go. That is their plan. Um, it, it's it, it's really good stuff. It's really good watching. And it shows that you don't need some big fight at the end. You don't need an explosion. Or you don't need the... You just... I mean, there is an explosion, okay. But actually, the tension is just these people talking and debating and arguing and betraying each other and killing each other. And it's, it's just so sort of low key. It's actually a very, very low key ending for quite a big epic story and it works. It's the perfect ending for it. Um, Michael Wisher as Davros, absolutely amazing, fantastic bit of casting works incredibly well with Tom as the doctor works really well with Peter Miles as NIDA and, every other character he interacts with. He, he's just such a wonderful creation. Um, and they, they really were onto something. It's no surprise at all that they retconned Davros's death and brought him back. And he has been brought back countlessly by different production teams and big finish love using Davros. And it all just works really, really well. Um, over to you then, Jimmy. Genesis of the Daleks. Yeah, for me, this is a great story, but I think, unlike you two, I'd say it falls apart a little bit towards the end, which I'll get to as I get to the end, but I'll start about the positives and the early stuff. For me, one of the things that I really do like about it is that this is Harry at his best. He, you know, he was created to be this sort of, you know, extra sidekick. He was created for, like, they were intending an older doctor and they need someone to do the physical stuff, so he couldn't actually do that. And usually they're just playing jokes at how dumb he is. But um, here he gets a couple of really great moments, like um, at the start when the Doctor stands on the landmine and Harry's putting the stones under and the Doctor's like, yeah, you get away before I step off it. But Harry's willing to risk himself for the Doctor. I mean, he hasn't known the Doctor that long, like Robot and Ark, and that happens over like a day or two. And he's still willing to sacrifice himself potentially, so that's nice. And the other thing I like is that he's cleverer than the Doctor at one point when the Doctor's getting pissed off at the Khalids for taking away the time ring and Harry's like, 
yeah, okay, it's important, but you don't want to let on its importance. And so, yeah, I love that Harry got to be smart and capable and confident here, which he, let's face it, doesn't usually. And he still had the fun stuff as well, like his gag at the start when they compared the technology being of the wrong time to, you know, a caveman having a radio and he's like, oh, playing rock music, which is very droll, but it works. And even with the rubbish clams, you at least get the funny line that, almost makes them worth it when Harry gets the gag about always putting his foot in it. Um, but, yeah, moving on from Harry, I love that the Carlids and Fowls are just as evil as each other in this. It absolutely contradicts what was said in the first Dalek story, but it really works well for this story. And, yeah, it's very atmospheric. Um, and I love that Tom gets some brilliant stuff in when he sent Sarah and Harry back to the Carlid dome and he thinks they're dead. Like Tom rarely underplays things, but he underplays this and yet you can still clearly see in his actions and just his manner how utterly distraught he is that they're dead or that he thinks they're dead. And then the same thing when his reaction when he finds them and they're alive. Like Tom often does play the sort of silly, foolish, fun sort of doctor, but when he gets dark stuff like this, he absolutely shines and it's really great to see. Um Another good thing I'll agree with you about Wishes Dav Ross. I, um, because of having seen it more and earlier, I tend to prefer Malloy and even these days Bleach from the new series. But Wisher is great. And for me, the moments he really excels are those quiet moments, like when he's pretending to have given in to the scientists' demands and that, and he's just talking very calmly. And then as soon as the scientists are gone or whatever, he's free to talk about what a big justice it is and get rage filled again. and yeah, he really plays it well, which I absolutely love. Um, but, yeah, for me, the thing is the first four episodes or so are really brilliant apart from the clams, but towards the end things fall apart. Like it's really Tom's speech about I, I know it's famous and it's in, an important moment and it gets in all the, you know, news reports about Doctor Who, but the two wires touch together, do I have the right? And it's like, I mean, it, Sarah's talking sense, of course. It's the Daleks. They're like the space Nazis that want to kill everyone. Yeah, of course you have the right. Oh, would you kill a child if, yeah, if it's Hitler, okay, kill the little bastard. I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah, it just, it, it, it's so undercut that, like, the Daleks are this great threat that kills million, untold millions, complete hate, like it's literally in the dialogue that they've got no emotions but hate. There's no positive to them, and yet... Tom ums and ahs about whether to kill them or not, and Sarah talks since about not doing it. But And then you have the the thing that stops the Doctor touching the wires the first time is, I forget which character it is, but they come along and they basically say that Davros is getting ready to surrender. And the Doctor's stupid enough to believe it. And then they get in that fight and, again, they, they need the time ring to get home and they are stupid enough to just not even notice that Tom's dropped it. And then, you know, when they're having all the arguments and they all look away so that neither can get away conveniently and, like, no one's paying attention. Like, the plot holes and stupid decisions in the last couple of episodes are just ridiculous. Like, it's, it's gone from a brilliant story at the start to everything being nonsensical at the end. And, I mean, again, the Doctor goes back to finally push the wires together this time and yet... Then they have, oh, a Daleks come, so he has to drop the wires. And, like, come on, it would take a fraction of a second to touch the wires and then drop them. Like, he could still get away and he doesn't. And then they have Dalek trundle over the wires and kill everyone anyway so that, oh, we've got what we want, but the Doctor didn't have to do it. It's, like, it's such a convenience, a plot contrivance. Like, oh, we, we want the Daleks to get destroyed, but we don't want the Doctor to be evil. Oh, let's make the Daleks accidentally destroy themselves. It's... It's a bit of a cheap cop-out of an ending, in my opinion. And then you've got that weird, silly little dancey moves that the TARDIS team do around the time ring at the end as they get taken off. And, like, I mean, I know the special effects weren't great, but I'm sure they could have done something better than that. Like, it was just so silly looking. And so, yeah, for me, love the story, love the start of it, but the ending completely falls apart, in my opinion, and that kind of ruins it for me. I think that, I mean, a huge part of Doctor Who fandom is the ability to overlook things. Um, and I think that because what else is going on in Genesis is so good, 
uh, people do overlook stuff like this. And you're right, you know, it, it does have its flaws like like anything else. Um, I, I like to imagine that one day we will have a completely flawless Doctor Who story, but it's not happened in 60 years. Uh, and I don't think it will happen in the next 60 years either. Um, I think we've come close. I think we've had things like Chimes of Midnight that you could reasonably argue is just perfect. But um, I, I don't I don't think there is any such thing as the perfect Doctor Who story. But I think Genesis, along with a handful of other stories, um, Caves of Androzani perhaps, and uh, that sort of thing, is as close as we are going to get to something being absolutely brilliant and like i say it, it's it's that ability to overlook the flaws that sort of allow us to enjoy it as much as we do i guess um it's an interesting take though that it does sort of fall apart towards the end like i say i think it genuinely picks up towards the end i think what's going on is so tense and yeah i do roll my eyes when they lose the time ring again and that sort of thing but i think overall it, it's sort of nobody can deny that there's something really special going on with Genesis, that it's an insanely good story. Um, we'll move on then. We'll move on to Revenge of the Cybermen. And like I say, I have a great deal of, uh, I guess it's nostalgic love for this one. It's flawed. It has its flaws. The flaws are very, very obvious. Um, everything from highly emotive camp Cybermen to uh, some questionable acting decisions to the seal of Rassilon randomly appearing on Boga. Um, it, it's it's a fun story. It's good. I think it actually utilises the Cybermen quite well. I think the Cybermen work best when they are sort of desperate trying to survive as opposed to in the middle of an empire or invading somewhere. Um, this is just a load of Cybermen trying to wipe out their own weakness so they can start again. Uh, I think gold as a weakness is a it's an interesting idea it's it feels much more 60s doctor who than 70s doctor who uh, despite the fact that it's not introduced until the 70s but obviously it's it's from a, a 60s writer it's from jerry davis and yes it's again quite heavily rewritten by robert holmes um, again big finish have demonstrated just how heavily it was rewritten by robert holmes I quite like the final result, though. Again, some excellent dialogue in there. And again, Sarah and Harry have got quite a bit to do. Uh, the Doctor gets to be a bit of an action man. Um, and it's just got that absolutely fantastic Harry Sullivan is an imbecile moment, which is, I, I think it just completely sums up the quirkiness of this still new Doctor. Um, yeah, I've, I've a lot of time for revenge. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I, I, it's one I'll always go back to and sort of look at fondly. It is flawed. It's not perfect, but it's it's a hell of a lot of fun. It's a good run around and it never leaves you bored. There's always something interesting and exciting going on, which compared to, you know, Ark in Space, like I said, whatever it was that Ark in Space was missing, I think Revenge has got. Um, so, Greg, do you want to talk to us about Revenge of the Cybermen? Well, I mean, I think what Ark in Space is missing is a sense of humor, and Revenge of the Cybermen certainly has one of those. Um, I feel kind of similarly to this one and to what you just said as I did to what we said about Death to the Daleks last season. Like, I I recognize that this is, you know, a bit more of a silly kind of story. I recognize that it's not, you know, intended to be taken completely seriously. I can see that, you know, the actors are, are really playing it up. Um, I still don't like it. <laughs> I think it's, um, it's just kind of dull. Like I, I, I kind of feel, you know, it's not, it's not as, as poor as the time monster, but I kind of feel similarly watching it in that I can see that everyone on screen is having a great time, but I just don't feel like I'm being brought along to have a great time with them. It's, it's just a really tedious kind of runaround story. Like it starts out with an interesting premise, you know, coming back to the beacon and there's all of a sudden a bunch of corpses everywhere, but it's, it's just handled so awkwardly. Like the doctor apparently knows like from moment one 
that they're thousands of years in the past from where they were before. And he's like, oh, the TARDIS isn't here yet. It's drifting backward in time. And Sarah and Harry are just like, oh, okay. Instead of responding correctly, which would be, what are you talking about? What do you mean drifting back in time? Because they have no, why would they know that they're thousands of years in the past? Like they, no one's really acting the way they should be. Like there's no real continuity with the previous stories at all, even though again, there really should be like it, it, that, that just strikes me as odd. You know, this is the first Cyberman story we've had since the invasion, since, you know, the, the we went the entire Pertwee era without having a Cyberman story. So six years and after this, we're going to go another seven years until we have a Cyberman story again when we get to Earthshock. So, like, this is the only one in, like, for a, a chunk of time that is literally half of the classic series. Like, this is the only Cyberman story. And it's it's the worst Cyberman story. And it's 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 really disappointing to me. It's the, it just, to me, I'm watching this, I'm like, okay, yeah, I see why they're not coming back. Like, it's, Jerry Davis, you know, wrote it. Unfortunately, I think you can see how valuable like Kit Pedler was to that writing team because, you know, not involved with this one and the quality just is not where it was with the Troughton era Cyberman stories, which were, you know, universally interesting, even if they got a little bit repetitive by the end. But like the, yeah, I, the, by the time the cyber leader is standing there with his hands on his hips gloating when the whole point of them is supposed to be that they're emotionless it's just, it, it doesn't work for me. Like it is as much as Genesis might be the greatest classic series, uh, Dalek story. I think revenge of the Cybermen is the worst classic series Cyberman story. You see, I'd struggle to pick a worst classic series Cyberman story. I, I genuinely quite like all of them. I mean, I, I, I like the Cybermen as a villain. I think they're a very, very interesting villain. And I think this has a, a very interesting and very different take on them. And I'm not saying it's the best take. I'm not saying it's a take that works particularly well, but it is interesting to sort of see these seventies disco Cybermen. As well, this is the to... only Cyberman story I don't care for. Like I know a lot of people dump on silver nemesis, but I've always had a soft spot for that one. So, I mean, for me to pick my least favorite, this is a pretty easy choice. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. I, I guess actually we are sort of spoilt by classic Cybermen stories. I think I'd probably have to pick, I don't know, maybe the Moon Base as the weakest, but I really like the Moon Base. It's not a bad story. It's just everything else is is so enjoyable. Um, Jimmy, what are your thoughts on Revenge of the Cybermen? Well, I'll start by saying I um, agree with Greg that it's the worst classic series Cybermen story, but I will say it's not the worst Cyberman story of all, but we'll get to that when we get to Matt Smith's era eventually. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think it's a decent enough story. But, um, I, yeah, the, the regulars are the thing that makes it shine, as seems like it'll be a thing for a lot of the Tommy era. Um, one thing I should say before I get too far is usually on um, these stories, when I rewatch watch them, I do watch with the special effects enhanced but um, I didn't have the season 12 Blu-ray yet at this time so I, some of these quibbles are about stuff as it was presented that may have been fixed in its um, special edition and I would hope were fixed but um, like for example the um, I think this happened in Arc 2 but it's a lot more obvious in this story The when you're looking out windows of the spaceship and you can see the stars the um, you know fairy lights um, you can see the floor and you can see the curtains. It's, I think you did get a bit of that in Ark, but it just feels a lot more noticeable in this story. Um, and the other thing is um, Voga itself. The, like the first three episodes it, on the scanner screen, it looks grey. Then in the last episode, they zoom in on it. They have a closer zoomed in shot of it on the scanner and it actually is gold. But then you go to it actually being seen not on the scanner but in space and suddenly it's brown. It's like, why wouldn't they just make a single prop for it and, you know, shoot it consistently? Like, just silly little faults like that. Um, and then you've got the fairly emotional Cybermen. Like, um, what I, I know wasn't done for the special edition on the Blu-ray but I think really should have been done is do the same as they did with Day of the Daleks and redo the voices because 
these were so ter- emotional and not very electronic. I love the sort of voices Big Finish often uses for the Cybermen, where they give it that sort of 10th planet sing-song intonation, but use the um, modulation more like the Troughton or Tennant eras. Uh, and for me, just the emotional, talking, relatively normal Cybermen, just it's never going to work. Um, and then another fault is the cyber ship. They have this dialogue about, oh, it's a completely unknown type of ship. And then two minutes later, you get it docking into Nerva and it's docking modular Nerva's line up perfectly. It's just, and then the rock fall, like um, the famous Harry Sullivan is an imbecile scene. Um, Harry knocking the dial or whatever is going to make it explode. And yet it survives a rock fall and doesn't move at all and doesn't explode. I mean, you know, it's it's a plot convenience, but it just, yeah, it doesn't really work as a cliffhanger when you look at it that way. Um, so, yeah, it's mostly a letdown, this story, which is a shame because I love the Cybermen and they're usually one of my favourite villains. But, yeah, this story just really does not do them very well, unfortunately. One of the few things I did like about the story is the cliffhanger at the end and having the lead in about, oh, the Brigadier's called us back to Earth. And, um because most of the time in the classic series, like the Hartnell era and sometimes the Trout era, you know, one story leads into the next. But usually the, this, this sort of era of the classic series, it doesn't happen anymore. And so to have a cliffhanger lead in for the next story, which isn't actually coming next week, it's the start of the next season, I think it's a nice little touch that they did that. And, of course, it makes you look forward to seeing the unit family again. But, of course, we'll get to that on our next episode. The one thing I will say as well is I love that the way the gold weakness is handled here. Like, by the end of the classic series, you're getting the golden arrows and gold coins that Ace throws in Silver Nemesis. But here, they actually give it a plot logic. Like, they say, oh, it's non-corrosive metal and the little flakes of gold dust clog up their systems. Like, the gold weakness actually makes a huge amount of sense in this story which absolutely does not become the case anymore as the classic series goes on. But I will say that is one big positive of Revenge of the Cybermen. It does handle the weakness to gold actually fairly realistically and fairly well. It's a shame, really, that the the sort of weakness to gold doesn't pop up earlier. I think if it's something that was established in the 60s and it sort of did have, should we say, a more solid sort of rule, uh, like you say, the, you know, the breathing apparatus stuff, I think it would have been used a lot better throughout. And I think it's something that actually the new series would still be interested in working with. I think Russell T. Davis actually said, we're not doing the gold thing, just like the word silver's banned and we are not doing the gold thing. And, you know, fair enough completely. It, it like you say, does get used in a bit of a daft way towards the end. Uh, but yeah, it does. It does make sense here. I wish it was something that was just a little more, so we say threaded into cyber law, I guess. Um, so it, it's, I, I still like this story and I, I'm aware that I'm sort of wearing the rose tinted nostalgia glasses with it. But I, I do think that there's a lot to enjoy. It fits perfectly in the season and it is an absolutely great story for early Tom. Um, I, you know, by the end of this, I really do feel as though we've got a fix on what his doctor's going to be like, certainly up until the end of season 14. Um, there's obviously a shift in production team and it sort of leads to a shift in the character and then the same thing happens again for his final season. Uh, but I think here we've very much got the Tom Baker that we're going to see for the next few years. Um, I'm looking forward immensely to moving on to Terror of the Zygons, which is... It's kind of an honorary season 12 story, but obviously was broadcast as part of 13 and we will talk about it next time we do one of these episodes. But I think we've had a good run of stories here. I think that season 12 quite rightly deserves to be as well known as it is, as fondly remembered as it is. And I think perhaps a lot of it is nostalgia. I think a lot of people may sit down and watch it and realise that bar Genesis, it's probably not as good as they remember if they've not seen it for a while. But nevertheless, it is very good. It does what it sets out to do very well. The main purpose of the season is get this new Doctor established and sort of make sure the fact that he's so different from previous Doctors works and Robot achieves that, but the rest of the season also contributes greatly. And I think without such a strong first season, 
uh, Tom Baker wouldn't be as fondly remembered as he is. As we've mentioned, I think the best is yet to come. I think we've uh, we've got two very, very exciting season-by-season season episodes coming up now. I think 13 and 14 are just... It's difficult to find a story that I don't like from these runs. That being said, actually, um, I'm not going to spoil what it is now, but what I would perhaps call my least favourite classic story of all comes up in the next couple of seasons. Um, but we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, meanwhile, though, that's all we've got time for. It's been great talking about this fairly unique season, I think, because of the production team crossover and sort of a lot of the stories being commissioned by one team and produced by another. It is pretty unique. It's it's one of those transitional seasons in the same way that season seven was, I suppose. Um. But it's it's been good to talk about it. It's been enjoyable and I'm looking forward to coming back for 13. So for now, I'll say thank you and goodbye to Greg. Thank you and we'll see you for season 13. And thank you and goodbye to Jimmy. Thanks. Can't wait for the next one. And uh, yeah, roll on talking about 13 and 14 because it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, thank you very much for listening to a podcast of spurious morality and we will be back next week goodbye now <laughs>